You are listening to the ESG and Coffee Podcast on investing, strategy, and sustainability, hosted by Graham Sinclair. We do everything from idea generation, research, analysis, and we also don't outsource to a separate ESG team, Mm -hmm. a separate engagement team, governance team, Mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, there are resources around RBC which would go into this, but we do all of that essentially integrated uh, analysis. Mm-hmm. And then we end up uh, constructing the portfolios, buying buying the stocks, selling the stocks. And we then actually also do all our own proxy voting and engagement. So mm. again, that's essentially done by uh, myself mm. because we think it's much more powerful having that decision making embodied in the person who's trying to in the round assess Mm. everything there is uh to do with um with the company so within team i think it's it's pretty good uh and then we also speak with other teams within uh rbc as well for a lot of different thinking i sort of alluded to this Uh, i am a playwright i do theater stuff Uh, i also organize um something which I've loosely called a mingle, where you can just get together with other people to exchange their first ideas. I mean, that's broader than just investment. That's just trying to keep an open mind about how the world works and how we can all be involved in making it better. I'm very pleased to welcome you back to the ESG and Coffee podcast with me, Graham Sinclair. Had a little hiatus as I worked on a number of projects and we had COP26. Uh, most exciting for me, at least, is my syllabus is now complete and up on the Harvard Extension School website. Please go and check that out. I would love to have you take up one of the last rem- few remaining seats for my new course called Making the Sustainable Investing Case, beginning in January of 2022. In Season 1, Episode 7, my interview is with Ben Yao. He's Portfolio Manager, Global Equities at RBC Global Asset Management. I first met Ben around 2019 in Back Bay, Boston for coffee at Wired Puppy Cafe, a uh, lovely red brick building, three-story building in, in Back Bay, Boston. I recommend it to you. Ben's earliest memory of investing was around the age of five. He tells this wonderful story with his dad, which is poignant given what happened later, Uh, but listen to Ben's uh, charming description using Lego blocks. You'll quickly appreciate that Ben has superb linguistic skills, perhaps those of a thespian, and yes, he does perform on stage. He has his own one-man show, thinking bigly, I'll include a note to that in the show note, and he performs on stage uh, in London. He also has his own podcast. Ben poses insightful questions back to me and offers complex multi-layered answers which I really appreciate and because we have our long form interview format he's got the space to do that so I really learned a lot. You can listen to my challenge to him on the concept of ESG Alpha and his point counterpoint. So how does Ben and his team at RBC work to integrate ESG seamlessly into the investment analysis? Well Ben describes four items looking at portfolio companies' winning business model, end market growth, market share opportunity, and management and ESG practices. Ben reflects proudly on the op-ed that he had in the Financial Times and the FTFM, the Financial Management-Focused Periodical that comes out every Monday, back in 2018. And I'll quote from it here uh, as the end of the introduction to the episode because I think it sets it up quite neatly. Quote, I sit down for lunch with a small group of investors and the top executives of a company with a $14 billion market capitalization. Collectively, these investors manage hundreds of billions of dollars in assets directly as portfolio managers or indirectly as analysts. This type of meal happens daily in places such as London and New York. Wine is offered but rarely drunk iPads dominate as the medium for note-taking. Everyone concentrates in earnest. The chief executive starts by referring to the importance of people, culture, values, and purpose. These are the principles set down by the company founder more than 60 years ago. Not a single note 
is taken on this point, unquote. So what happens next? Well, join me in enjoying this long form interview with Ben Yao. On today's episode of ESG and Coffee podcast, I'm pleased to welcome Ben Yeo, Senior Portfolio Manager, Global Equities at RBC Global Asset Management. Please check the episode note for more on Ben. He's on Twitter at Ben Yeo Ben, quote, writer, investor, autism aware, sustainability, healthcare, theater, and chair of at Agency of Coney, giving 10,000 pound grants. And then he's on LinkedIn, where quick descriptor is portfolio manager, global equities, chair, playwright, angel, sustainability, autism aware. He has many hats. Thanks. Welcome, Ben. Thank you. Where in the world are you today, Ben? So I'm sitting in London, UK, as opposed to London, Canada. Right, or London, Massachusetts or something. Yeah. I think you found London's a lot of places. <laughs> um, there's an East London in South Africa on the coast too. Um, ben, it looks like you're in the library. It reminds me less of the old law library, more of the library at the UN Environment Program back in, in Geneva. I wish I had a library yeah. behind me. Um, what, uh, first question, what would you be ordering if we were at your local cafe or coffee shop, tea room, pub? being in the UK, what would I be ordering for you, sir? So I'm, I'm drinking Darjeeling tea, uh, but I'm trying to cut down on coffee, although I do drink coffee, so uh, double espresso would be possible. Uh, uh -huh. Tea would be high up on my list. If they had a nice oolong tea, I would do that. And if they didn't really have anything that interesting, uh, I do quite like uh, kombucha with these kind of new okay. oh, newfangled yeah. uh, fermented drink things, but uh, tea is very good. Excellent. Good. All right. We like to start the podcast uh, with the big picture here. Um, you may well recall the tragedy of the Horizon speech by Mark Carney back in 2015 at Lloyd's uh, when you're still with the Bank of England. So we'd like to begin by picking up the thread that Sir David Attenborough offered up uh, in his fantastic Netflix documentary, Our Planet. Did, did you have you watched that, by the way? Did you watch that with kids? I haven't, actually. I watch relatively little TV. All right. Well, if, if you're going to make an exception, it, it's I worth will it. for that. I have heard uh, of some of Attenborough's things. Yeah, he references two significant data points, and I've asked you to grab those two data points and, and add in the third. So I'll ask you the question, you'll give me the data point, and then we'll kind of debrief. In the year you earned your first career paycheck, which you do not have to tell us, roughly how much was each data point? So world population. Uh, about 6.2 billion people. Okay. S&P 500? Uh, 1192 averaged over the year. Mm. Carbon dioxide in parts per million? Well, this is kind of quite easy because we've been going up around two parts per million every year pretty consistently. So I'm going to give you a clue. You can go back uh, about 20 years. It's a little bit over. So it's around 370 ppm. Wow. Okay. So for reference, for our guests, uh, for our listeners, Population 7.9 billion, roughly, in May of 2021. S&P 500, about 4,100. And parts per million, 417 parts per million. Ben, how does it make you feel to hear those numbers played back where, where you began and where we are now? So I think one observation is that humans in general and I would include myself in that, struggle to think about the long term. I'm not sure whether it's, we're not exactly programmed for it. You know, animals say where we come from aren't, don't seem to be particularly programmed for it. So it, it's, quite, it's quite tricky. Mm. Uh, but I, I would counterpoint perhaps the other, uh, you know, with the kind of your grow the pie hat on with a, a couple of other interesting ones mm -hmm. uh, on that. So, uh, and because as you might have picked up on my, that healthcare is one of my, my important right. lenses that I see the world through. Do you know roughly today how many um, uh, death in childbirth per a thousand we're having globally? So a thousand women give, uh, give birth uh, and what maybe, the number? Maybe five. 
It's 28, actually, globally. In fact, even, wow. even the US is not as low as five, uh, uh, although the US is not the lowest. Uh, right. So it's 28, it's 28 today. And mm-hmm. go back 20 years, mm-hmm. what number do you think it was? Double that. Yeah, so roughly double. It's about mm-hmm. 51. Mm-hmm. So in 20 years, we've also halved, mm-hmm. um, uh, we've halved on uh, death in childbirth. And then the flip side is, um, average life expectancy. So you can see it the other way is, is a major component is right. how long are we living today on average? Right. Um, 71. Yeah, pretty close. It's about 73. And, uh, and 20 years ago? 67. 67. Yeah. So we've, we've added about, we've added about uh, four, five or six years with, within mm-hmm. that. And then actually wow. added a lot more in uh, poorer countries than we have, obviously, in richer countries. Excellent. So I think that's the, the two counterpoints, I think. But also very bad of thinking about the long term on that. So we're, we're pretty bad thinking long term positive and thinking long term yeah. uh, negative, which is quite an interesting observation. Yeah, I, I think that's a, an excellent insight. This is why we're interviewing people, good people like you. Um, right, so let's move on quickly then to some fast espresso shot questions. Set one, we have four sets across the interview. Are you ready? You can try it. What is your earliest memory of investing? So my earliest memory is actually discussing uh, investing with uh, my dad, uh, who had a kind of passing interest. He was actually a travel agent Mm. um, pretty much all of his life. Mm. Uh, But he did have an interest in stocks and shares. And I I was really rather young. Can't remember exactly. Maybe high single digits, like nine, maybe Mm -hmm. nine to 12. And we were discussing um, a share he had. He had a handful of random shares. On for an industrial, a UK industrial conglomerate. Hmm. And the share price had moved up quite a lot. And he was like, oh my gosh, the share price has gone up. And I, and I said, well, why is this? And it was because it was going to be split up. Hmm. And this was kind of, I remember this because I was like, this is strange. It's the same company, but right. you somehow split it into pieces and it's worth a lot more. And this was just quite, quite beguiling. It's like, okay, I've got this Lego set. Um, you know, this is kind of how yeah. I'm thinking and you break right. up the Lego pieces and right. somehow those individual pieces you're telling me yeah. are worth more than when you put them together. Um, and the, and the answer at the time was yes. So that's my earliest mm. investing memory. I don't even really know what happened to it and what we did or whatever, but it was just right. this thing that like, it was a really big change in value one day and he commented it, but mm. actually in some ways, nothing fundamental had changed. Mm. Now I'm picturing you taking your Lego sets to some CEO when he's trying to sell you on an M&A deal. And you say, yeah, exactly. it's the Lego. Show me what changes. Right? Yeah. All right. Second question. What is your philosophy of investing in one sentence? So we look to make a positive difference to the companies we own mm-hmm. and through responsible long-term investing, therefore into society and other stakeholders. Okay. And what switched you, Ben, on to ESG? So there isn't a, a quick answer to this, but about 20 years ago, I was involved in a lot of the collaborative work with looking at access to medicines in Africa, particularly actually um, HIV drugs. Mm-hmm. And a long story short is there was a collaboration between NGOs, between mm-hmm. governments, uh, between pharmaceutical companies, asset managers and asset owners. Mm-hmm. And I was involved in that. And that made me think that this whole area could well be, or should at least, or a lot of it be win-win, that we can look at growing the pie, solving these problems, and that actually a lot of things don't have to be zero-sum game Mm. with some of these things. And and that was a kind of key insight into looking at some of these um, extra financial areas. Wonderful. Thank you for that. Um, How do you choose to define sustainable investment or investing with ESG factors in less than 30 words? I haven't done a word count on this, but for me, it would be the, what we would say, extra financial capitals, which drive positively or negatively long-term wealth value creation. Hmm. I found myself using the phrase ESG positive now, just to remind people that there's also ESG negative. Um, and finally, question five of the first set of espresso shot question. What is your biggest investing mistake so far? I guess on an individual stock level, I have invested in a biotech which hasn't done very well and has probably lost about 60% of its 
equity value. But then again, they are trying to cure diseases which have never been cured before, so have actually created a lot of science. Hmm. Fair. All right. Uh, so we've got three deep dives across the interview. This is deep dive one. Here we go. Um, first, first, broadly on kind of the business of investment. Yeah. So your job title, what, what does it mean? What, what is wrapped up in your job title and what is not your job? So my title is Senior Portfolio Manager. Uh, how our team does it is we do everything from idea generation, research, analysis. And we also don't outsource to a separate ESG team, mm -hmm. a separate engagement team, governance team, mm -hmm. all of that. Uh, there are resources around RBC which would go into this, but we do all of that essentially integrated uh, analysis. Mm -hmm. And then we end up uh, constructing the portfolios, buying, buying the stocks, selling the stocks. And we then actually also do all our own proxy voting and engagement. So again, mm. that's essentially done by uh, myself mm. because we think it's much more powerful having that decision-making embodied in the person who's trying to in the round assess mm. everything there is uh, to do with, um, with the company. Mm. Uh, so the one element that I guess we don't do, or this I, I suppose is a sort of a scant thing, is we don't do any real uh, marketing mm. and I'm not remunerated on anything to do with um, AUM or... Mm gathering all that mm. we are actually all focused on long-term performance which is a thing that our clients mm. get okay thank you that's uh, one of the better answers i've had on the podcast because it <laughs> it makes it accessible for the average listener someone who's in the industry but also outside of the industry and makes it clear kind of the approach and we'll unpack more of that later thank you um how does one buy say someone's listening to the podcast they really enjoy what you have to say ben how do they buy what you do? How do they buy your investment service? Sure. So actually, it depends on which jurisdiction you're in. Mm -hmm. But in the US, uh, there are what we would call mutual fund or 40 act uh, vehicles, which you can mm -hmm. look at if you're a, a retail investor. Mm -hmm. uh, as an institutional investor, you can, you can go through an institutional channel to us, mm -hmm. and there's institutional share classes. Mm -hmm. uh, that is actually the same in Canada. There are uh, mutual fund ways of uh, investing and then institutional ways of investing uh, mm. as well. And actually that replicates in the UK where, um, and Europe, there is, we do much less direct retail. So there are uh, a couple of channels and service providers who can do that. We do mostly institutional uh, business endowments, foundations, mm -hmm. corporates, uh, local government pension funds like that within, within Europe and Asia. It's still possible, but mostly that will be institutional business. Okay. And, and to, I, I don't know the answer. So I'm asking you is, so is your strategy available as a standalone or is it kind of like a fruit salad mixed with a whole bunch of others? Uh, nope. Just... Standalone. All, all of those are available standalone. Okay. It is. Yeah. Okay. Great. Um, and what, how do you, how do you get to set the price for your investment services? Uh, you know, for myself, I'm, I'm looking closely at uh, exchange traded funds, ETFs, um, and I really appreciate how they drive down the cost, but most often they have passive vehicles tracking an index. I know there's active non-transparent ETFs nowadays, but this question of, of cost and fees, performance needs to be net of fees. So anything that costs is gonna be something of a drag of performance, unless you go chasing the performance. And I've got a reference to Kathy Wood a bit later, the latest famous active investor. But how do you how do you choose to price your investment service? Yeah, so actually we uh, have a range of different pricing uh, mechanisms, particularly on institutional level, uh, to suit uh, client preferences. So there's two theories about pricing. So one is that you should simply take a, a flat fee basis points and you can argue about the value of where you're going to do that, mm -hmm. depending on, say, the risk return you're getting, what we in the industry call alpha. Mm -hmm. But also uh, there is some element maybe for if you think my engagement work is valuable or some of the other services that we might be providing for you in terms of, you know, we are, I think sometimes we forget we're financial services. So we should be giving a service right. like you know, if you go into a restaurant and you want a vegetarian meal, they, 
you, you know, they don't turn you away because it's like, oh, you should be eating omnivore. You know, it's like, well, yeah. we're providing a service. So there, there is an element of that. Uh, but then the other theory is that you should be more aligned by charging a performance fee. So you can mm. have a base fee. The idea would actually be you right. maybe match right. the passive index because then you're m matching the so-called market return or what we would mm. call beta. And then to the extent that you outperform, you can take a portion of that fee. Right. And to the extent that you underperform, you actually get uh, you actually don't get any of that. Right. And we, we uh, I actually think there is um, a theoretically better alignment with performance fees. Mm. Uh, but I understand because some clients don't like the fact that you can generate fees in down markets because it's a relative game because you have to do right. performance fee versus right. something. Right. And we're in a benchmark game, right. whereas some people are more absolute. So that would then be an easier way to have uh, a performance fee. Uh, but because we can see there's a merit in both, uh, we we would actually offer we would actually offer both to where it's available uh, mm. to clients. Okay, that that's very interesting, and maybe for some people it's a bit too detailed, but it's really interesting for those of us in the industry. Okay. And what we try to do with the podcast, we talk about you, the human, of course, and investment, but also the business of investment, right? So this yeah. is why we're trying to join the dots. Yeah, and the transparency in in our in overall in the industry isn't that great, and there's a lot of yeah. middlemen people, so this. Uh, right. arguably uh, inflates fees and this is why yeah. you know when you're thinking about it this is the theory of two and this is why you know when you when you think about it you, you ask why do some of these hedge funds seem to do so well uh, and why do they earn so much money is because they have very large performance fees mm. uh, but the flip side that they argue is that they don't get paid anything when it when it goes right. wrong yeah and psychologically out of interest this is one of the reasons why seemingly they still manage to attract money again even if they've mm even if they failed once, because people feel that they have a lot of skin in the game. So yeah. rightly or wrongly to yeah. it, they're kind of like, well, we live or die with them. And we mm. feel that's very aligned. Mm. And that's attractive to some, uh, to, to some mm. client base. Mm. And, and speaking of selling, so marketing, selling, what have you, how do you, how do you pitch ESG as part of your investment approach to clients in 2021 and if you could, could you reflect on how how was it back in 2013 or 2015, what have you, like some decent chunk of time ago? How, how has it changed in the conversation that you were able to have with a prospective client? Talk about your investment approach and the ESG piece of that. Well, if you go back 10 years, I've got an amusing anecdote in the US market. So obviously, we, you know, our primary thing isn't marketing. So we speak to some marketing people and mm. things. And our advice given to us 10 years ago is please remove any reference to ESG from your slides because in the US market, we mm. might not even get in through the door. Mm. Uh, so I don't know quite exactly how the truth was it, but that was genuine advice mm. given to us I, I, about, I, about 10 years ago. I, um, I, can, I can share with you that I had an MBA when I was teaching between 2000 and 2012. He went to a global investment bank on Wall Street in an interview. And he was doing great in the interview till he raised the question. It was in the MG sector. He got, he got pinged and dropped from the shortlist for asking about climate and pricing of CO2. Just there you go. So it shows short time. Right. So that's a relatively short time, right? Because we, we went back uh, 20 years with our, some of our things. Um, how I talk about it today, uh, it's still relatively complex, but I, I tend to use this notion of extra financial capitals mm. and that what they are doing is they can create what I would call, because I tend to speak in the language of finance to these people, mm -hmm. but what we would call uh, contingent assets. So these are investing in people, investing in the future. Mm -hmm. So you could call them ESG assets, sustainability assets. You can call them intangible assets. Uh, typically you call them assets, which actually are not on the balance sheet. Mm. Uh, but also the flip side is true. In fact, it's often easier to think on the flip side. So you don't invest in your people. You don't invest in R&D. You don't look after the environment. You know, your best people leave you. You get fined. You have no future. That is creating essentially a contingent liability mm -hmm. or um, as to use your parlance, negative ESG, uh, ESG risk or liability. Mm -hmm. And that will come home to bite you. And what you're looking for in an integrated ESG approach is you're looking for companies which are creating, call them contingent assets or sustainable mm -hmm. ESG assets, which haven't been recognized by the market. So this is an inefficiency. 
um, that's partly inefficient also because a lot of these things don't necessarily appear in the cash flow and balance sheet, hard to measure, uh, intangible. And you're looking to avoid companies which are cutting these corners where you might actually even have a near term rise in, say, cash flow. Like you say, you cut your workforce in mm. extremis, yeah. you know, no paychecks, yeah. right? That goes up. Yeah. But if you have no workers or your best workers leave you because they feel their work conditions are really bad, then you've destroyed longer term value. That would mm. be a classic mm. kind of negative, uh, you know, call it ESG, which again is a phrase we don't particularly like because you kind of think, well, is that the S? And yeah, I guess that it is the S of of ESG, okay. but it is yeah. one of these extra financial capitals. Mm. Mm. And, and that's reflected so much. I, I don't know if you, you were tracking, you've been tracking how this minimum wage debate that's happening in the US and elsewhere around the world, frankly. And it's almost like the system has reached the limits of people who are willing to pay for dirt cheap labor in certain jobs, given the stress and given COVID, you know, effectively being frontline workers and so on. And this question of, just how many, how few employees could you get to run the shop? So, so and experiences for me in many parts of the world, but especially in the US is at a large store and it's an, almost impossible to find a human to help you in that store. And so they've just cut wages as much as they could have. And then that results in some kind of experience. So now if, if I'm able to, and I'm privileged, of course, I will choose a store for groceries where there's humans who actually work there. Right. Um, let's move on then on uh, pick up the the shape of the shop. So the size of assets that your firm has and, and in your portfolio, could you just give us a ballpark on kind of what is the size of assets you're working with? Sure. So RBC uh, asset management overall is mm -hmm. over 500 billion in assets. Mm -hmm. My fund is over 25 billion in assets, mm -hmm. uh, approximately US dollars. Okay. And and how how does it feel to hear yourself say that sentence? Like, do you feel? I mean, is it does it feel like being the captain of a very large ship or the pilot of a A three eighty? How does how does it feel to say the portfolio I'm looking after is twenty five billion in other people's money? How, how does it feel? So we feel a huge responsibility in stewardship on other people's. Uh, other people's money and some of that is you know the lady in the street coming mm -hmm. through that retail channel so some yep. quite small amounts yeah. uh, and then some of you know very big some of the biggest uh, corporates and uh, institutions uh, in the world and uh, we know this is part of that you know strapline uh, purpose we want to really do uh, we want to really do right uh, by them and uh, you know your primary thought always is we're trying to meet their needs Mm -hmm. Their needs are partly, say, financial, where they want to retire, or funding an endowment, or on all of those, and all of those type of things. Um, but often they also come with essentially what I would call uh, stewardship needs, as in, mm -hmm. you know, they, they themselves are thinking for the long term. They want to make sure that their companies that they are are thinking from the long term. And if you think about the purpose of asset management, aside from meeting uh, client needs, there's this kind of secondary one where essentially to put it in everyday parlance is you're allocating capital uh, to good companies and good ideas, value creation ideas, and away from bad companies and bad ideas. And the bad companies and bad ideas uh, fade away, become unsustainable and, and disappear. And actually those really poor ideas are no longer, uh, are no longer part of society. Mm. Hmm. And, and um, the investment horizon, another classic KPI for portfolio. So for the work that you do directly on your portfolio, what is the investment horizon that you use? So investment horizon is quite interesting because it seems on the surface quite a, a simple question, but there are at least two components or three components to that. So one is the, the horizon which you do your analysis over. Mm -hmm. And that analysis can be, in fact, is often super long term, 10, 20, 30 year uh, DCFs um, I would be constructing. So thinking about uh, thinking about the company. Then another level is then how long uh, uh, discounted cash flow, discounted cash flow. Yes. Yeah. So uh, uh, how how many years are you modeling out what you think this company will be doing over over a time frame? And in fact, arguably for a couple of hours, we you know you, we've now gone on 
beyond mid-century if you're thinking about some of these net zero and other things. Mm. The, the second element to that is how long do you actually end up owning uh, a company uh, a yeah. company for, mm. which actually goes into portfolio turnover yeah. and things yeah. like that. Yeah. And so on average at the moment, we're owning our companies for just over five years. Although within that, there is a range. So some companies we've owned uh, for longer than 10 yeah. and some are, some are relatively new for that. So again, you've got an argument about what is, uh, what is median or not. But then you've got a question about uh, over what horizon are you thinking around about uh, investment returns as in how long should you be within that to try and get the kind of returns uh, that you're looking for. And again, that can vary on an institutional or retail level, but I would, su I would suggest that you look for between five and 10 years. So call it bull uh, point of, of seven. There's a lot of people on pressure on as low as three years, but usually at three years for this kind of fundamental investing, um, you sometimes are only just beginning to see, um, say, if you take my theory correctly about how some of these intangibles then start to get priced into what the market realizes. Three years tends to be the bare minimum that that starts. But you can find exceptions for everything, right? You can, you can get something which is a very long-term idea, like a patent life, mm -hmm. and it can disappear, and the market can discount that back very, very quickly. Or alternatively, something that you think has been around for, forever and, and, and is obvious can sometimes take very many, many years before um, you know, the market's kind of almost acting as this weighing machine and it finally weighs up and says, yes, actually, that's very valuable. So sorry for that long answer to what seems a deceptively simple question and you want a year's, but it actually depends on kind of how you're thinking and, and what. And I don't want people to get the impression, actually, this is kind of industry-wide when you even say three years or five years or whatever than that. Often the analysis is actually longer than that because well, how, how can it not be? Exactly. So, I mean, you're in healthcare, right? So some of these machines you see, I mean, those can't be done and dusted in three years or even five years or what have you. Gosh darn it, the, the dentist's light fixture, which I stare at as I hate every moment of being at the dentist, I'm like, that, that light's been up there for a decade, probably. Yeah. Right. And most dental, the sort of big dental machines you, you see on average is at least a seven year life. And actually that's extended mm. uh, a bit of, of late. So mm. yeah, mm. seven years at least. Okay, great. Um, I picked up a piece. Uh, thank you for all the materials you shared and those will go in our show notes as always. Thank you. I picked up a, a phrase here I just want to run through uh, and I'm quoting. We believe that by evaluating the health of extra financial factors, including environmental, social and governance, we are not only able to reduce risk and uncover alternative sources of alpha, but also achieve a responsible allocation of capital, unquote. What do you mean? Could you unpack that? What, what do you mean by that sentence? Sure. So actually I alluded to it already. So this is the idea that if you're building, say, uh, a human capital asset, I'm using the language of, of finance there, right? But these, these are people But with, with, with that. Mm -hmm. And so you're allocating to companies building a strong uh, a strong employees, uh, very engaged, uh, very uh, productive. And particularly if the market doesn't recognize that because employees don't go on the balance sheet, um, you know, it's harder to assess. So you should be creating long-term return value because it's something the market's missed um, and, you've, and you've seen. But in allocating capital to a company which is doing a, a good thing, then if you're taking that away from a company which is more mediocre, then you also... Uh, allocating uh, capital in a more responsible way. And then further, although it's not with, within that sentence, I would say then how you're treating the ownership of that capital when you own a piece of a business, if that's how you're thinking about it, how you're then stewarding that capital is that extra level of, res uh, of, uh, of responsibility. Are you thinking that you own a piece of your uh, a piece of your house, or are you just renting a room or renting a share certificate? And this ownership mindset, I think, is quite an interesting uh, concept, kind of debated within finance. But again, actually, if you to extend the analogy of of a of a house, if you own the house, you might be thinking, well, you know what, we should be thinking about a green roof. We must be thinking about insulation. We might be thinking about our place in the community, what we do with our neighbors. You might be thinking about supporting the local corner shop because you don't want it to, to, to disappear. All of those things around the house. If you're just renting the room for three months, maybe you don't think about those sorts of things because you've got a kind of shorter term mindset, but you don't necessarily have to do this. So even if you've got, say, your strategy is a hedge fund uh, strategy where you don't own 
uh, companies for, for very long. So you might think, okay, you've got a short-term mindset. If you go into a hotel room and you're only there one or two nights and you notice that the window is broken, even though you're there for one night, do you tell management or not? If you that's have, a, yes. <laughs> yeah, if you have an ownership, how am I going to make, even though I'm only owning this room or renting this room for a day, I can see there's something that you should improve. And I'm going to tell the person who can do this about how they would do that, even though I might not. In fact, I probably will never to put a, come to this hotel or hotel room again. But you have this sense of I am for a short time part of this thing where there's an ownership or a thing am i thinking about that long-term good yeah okay maybe there's only at the margin okay if they manage to fix it within two hours i will still enjoy the benefits of that over my room night stay but for the time that i have owned that asset or renting that asset i am thinking like an owner in terms of growing the pie in, in, in this sense for it so this is where actually the ownership mindset can be applied even on these shorter term horizons even though you're typically thinking over the longer term horizon because it's easier to think like that actually this, the same principles can apply even for shorter term horizon uh, mm. which is why you know for instance shorter term holders should still be voting their proxies responsibly mm. excellent and we'll pick up uh, proxy voting in, in the third deep dive so i'd like to move on now to where rbc describes their approach and first up kudos to you and your whole team who a put this out there and put it you know fairly succinctly uh, just using my paraphrasing here, there's four elements, a winning business model, end market growth, market share opportunity, and management and ESG practices. Could you explain a bit about how you use those, they're not really KPIs, but they're just mm, factors, I guess. How do you look at those four elements when you're looking in your specialty around healthcare? Sure, okay, well, thinking about healthcare, uh, Around the business model, within healthcare, it's actually relatively simple. You're looking to improve as best you can net benefit to your stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Because if you can't produce net benefit to your stakeholders, in this case, patients and doctors and things, what sustainable capitalism does or what capitalism does in general is you go bankrupt, right? Think about it in a simpler case. If you can't provide a customer any value, they stop buying from you. And really, the customer is the only thing giving you cash flow or revenue, right? So you go bankrupt. If you can't give them value, however you want to define it, that, that goes. But if you think about net benefit within healthcare, broadly it splits into two buckets. Are you saving lives? Quality of life, extension of life within that. But essentially you're saying, does my product or service save lives? And then the second element is uh, where we are today. Does it save the system money? And if you can do one or two of those things, or preferably both, then you will be having a business model which is growing the pie net benefit to the stakeholders. Yes, there are kind of trade-offs within that, but you can see that if you're saving lives, you are probably going to be uh, providing this net benefit to your stakeholders to your most important one. So you have a business model which can meet that kind of, uh, that kind of hurdle, which essentially means it probably has, again, to use the parlance, it has an edge. It has something, it has a secret source. It has something where you're being able to save lives where another product or service couldn't or doesn't exist or don't. So better be with a winning business model, a business model which say, say saves lives. Now that is better or amplified if you are in a growing end market. That's just simply the fact that for instance, aging population. So if you're working with something which is good there, uh, your market size is, is better. Um, it's probably easier to see it within other areas, but for instance, if you are the best maker of checkbooks, checkbooks are kind of a shrinking thing, as opposed to say electronic payments, which is a growing thing. So it can just amplify the edge that your uh, that your uh, that your business model has. Now, if you have an edge in your business model, and again, you can see whether it defines on market or market share, but if you have an edge, you're probably growing market share. If you're not growing market share, and actually that calls into question your original edge because, well, you probably are not better than your product. You're not probably not saving lives versus other products and services because otherwise that, that, share, would be, uh, that share would be growing. 
And then last but not least, you're thinking about a management team thinking responsibly or responsibly. Some of the ESG stuff comes in here, although we like to describe it now, we kind of call it out so people know, is that elements of this extra financial, the call it the ESG, both positive and negative, is really integrated throughout all of those, all of those elements. But you see it in the culture and mentality of management. So it's why you kind of have to also assess it there, although it goes through all of those various strands. Excellent. That's really helpful. There's so much there and there's more we want to get to. So I'll try and pull out some, some threads from that. Thank you. Uh, so let's flick through some fairly quickly now. Uh, you've described the approach to ESG where it's, it's a rounded approach. You, you're kind of doing all those things your colleagues are. So how would you answer the question that you would get in an RFP, which is how many humans at your shop do ESG? How, how do you answer that question? So uh, on a fund basis, so when we talk about, so RFPs will typically be about the looking at our global equity strategy. It's our, our whole team does it. So that's, uh, that's all of our team. Uh, so that's uh, eight within portfolio uh, management. Uh, and then we have three within risk and portfolio uh, management as well, uh, okay. because we all, we all do it. And so this is why, you know, actually, I think you might even have, have asked me this sort of because like, some people ask, oh, well, how much of what you do is ESG or not? And I, and I think in the integrated approach, that's a little bit like the wrong question. It's a little bit like asking, is light a wave or a particle? Right. The answer is yes, uh, because you, you can't maybe this goes back, we're going to refer to this Lego conglomerate set, right? Because you can't just break a piece off. It's, it's this whole thing and you having to assess it in the round. And, and can you really say it's 23% it's of one or 47% mm. of another? It's kind of meaningless. And it, and it means uh, you're slightly, well, hopefully we come to understand that the way we're looking at it isn't, isn't the way that that, uh, that way that splits out. There can be just one thing when you can think, you know what? That isn't good enough. We're not gonna. We're not gonna invest. Or within, you know, within healthcare, you think, you know, saving lives is like, you know, the the highest possible purpose potentially. But you know, it's it's got to be more more than that. It's not just like some sort of purpose statement. Hmm. Okay. Um, another uh, piece that will often come up in RFPs, and to be clear, requests for proposals RFP, is carbon footprint analysis. Mm -hmm. So question, how does your firm conduct carbon footprinting or temperature mapping or climate scenarios modeling analysis to review your exposure now and in the future? So this could be a really long uh, session in itself, uh, but I'll just give you the headline. So we look at uh, what you would call carbon scopes, your carbon footprinting. Mm -hmm. There are three scopes, carbon scope one, two, and three. One and two are more direct. Uh, three is more uh, indirect. Uh, but just to give you a sense of it, out of like the top, top 2,000 companies in the world, um, about 50%, I think it's actually now about 60%, give you data on scope one and two, whereas the other 40 to 50% is generally estimated. If you look at those third-party estimations, uh, they can differ quite wildly. Uh, I've seen differences between 10% up to about 150% in terms of estimates of where that is. Now, carbon scope three on a global basis is about 60% of the puzzle, right? Although one company scope one and two can be another uh, company's scope three and right. we're going into the complications of that. Now, carbon scope three data, uh, which is also a little bit more patchy to assess is really only revealed by about 10 to 15% of companies at the moment. And really there are no good uh, estimations. It's very hard uh, to estimate it from the outside. So we give you this carbon scoping data and we talk about it, but I put big caveats uh, around it. Hmm. And so for instance, at the moment, uh, if you look at uh, global indices, they are on a carbon intensity. So this is how many tons per million dollars of sales that you do uh, is somewhere between 150 and 200. Uh, that's roughly the ballpark uh, of where you are. Uh, and our fund is roughly about 50. So again, this is the ballpark of where you are on, on that carbon scoping. Now you've talked about uh, you know, uh, climate or value at risk and climate scenarios and things. And we do that and we provide that. And there's also different third party uh, data providers. Uh, but I have to say that the, the models and things underlying it, when you get it to an academic uh, basis, are still somewhat, uh, are somewhat contested. You know, what does two degree alignment 
actually mean. I don't know if for people listening here, you should go and check out what an RCP scenario is, you know, where are we heading between two or three or things. Because for instance, uh, the, the climate consensus at the moment, for instance, is that we are not heading for four degrees and we're much more likely to be between two and three. And that's a change. But actually this scenario called RCP 8.5, which some people use as a business as usual one, actually hits you to four, which is not where current uh, policy and things uh, go. Like, don't get me wrong, a three is still really bad outcome, we think, for uh, a lot of the environment and things like that. But actually three is better than four. So th there, is, there is this other, this other thing there. So when you think about climate and that scenario analysis, which actually we do on these sort of portfolio levels, it's actually much more complicated than the, than the surface level would say. But to, uh, to round back and answer the question is, we give you carbon footprinting, we look at intensity, we give you scopes, and we give you commonly climate scenario a variable. But more importantly, we explain our, our thinking, why we think uh, companies where they are, how material it is, where the thinking is, life cycle analysis, sustainability plans, in a much more, well, integrated fashion than what I would say one or two data points might be giving you, which will uh, actually ultimately mislead. And I think actually some carbon footprinting uh, is somewhat uh, misleading. I'll give you just one other example about how it can be uh, misleading, in, just in a way that you've got to think through is, this is the complicated of, of, of the world being second or third order. You have someone like um, a lithium miner, right? We know mining is a pretty intense activity and there's a lot of other things around that. But without lithium, you're not making um, EV uh, electric car batteries. So you, you really got to think and square about this. Or you go the other way. Like uh, most people in the US have some sort of smartphone. Uh, every smartphone in the world has cobalt. A lot of that cobalt comes from very uh, difficult places in the world, like uh, DRC. So this interconnectedness in thinking is that there is this kind of complexity that you need to manage, which is not necessarily what one single uh, data point would be giving you. I, I'll I end think, there. I think that's a, a complicated answer to a complicated question. So I appreciate that. And, and you're right, it's probably gonna be the feature of another season of ESG and coffee, because I, I really want to go after this in more detail, because there seems to be more heat than light on the topic right now. Um, okay, very quickly, then, uh, sources of ESG data and analysis, you mentioned earlier that you kind of you put you draw on other sources, you've just referenced how maybe for some of the carbon work, you're working with some vendors. So very quickly, uh, some of the vendors or the approach that you're using to ESG data and analysis. Yeah, so we probably have, I haven't done a recent count, but probably 12 different data or service providers giving us different sorts of uh, ESG and extra financial information. And then you have what we call typical sell side, who pretty much every sell side house now has some sort of ESG or sustainability lens, right? And we have between 10 or 20 other uh, sell side uh, providers. So that's that's a lot of potential uh, data uh, to triangulate. Then actually thinking out aloud, you would add in, uh, uh, I read advice from two uh, providers who specialize in proxy advice. Uh, so you know, you'd put that under the G on ESG. So that's, you know, that's a couple of others uh, as well. So yeah, uh, a big set. Uh, and I think this alludes to maybe the thing behind that is at the moment, there isn't what I think you would perhaps want to call an ESG factor in the same way that if you think about standard financial theory, there are things called quality factors, momentum factors, value factors, which are fairly well defined. So you can argue about value a bit, right? So they will argue about price to book, price price to earnings, how you, how you do that. And actually there was a, there's a decent debate amongst even that, uh, that thing and how well studied. Whereas you look at the conglomerate of like ESG, so value you're maybe talking about five to 10 different parameters on that, that you can argue. Um, ESG is, uh, um, you know, an order of magnitude more than that with, with much uh, less agreement. So if you look at any one say ratings provider, the, the correlation isn't necessarily that great. And it's not even stable through time because their methodologies have moved through time. 
you know, which is one of one of these things. So that's the reason I think that if you're very interested in particularly an integrated fashion of doing it, how we're doing, you are going to have to take a variety of data sources, whether that's hard data points, as I said, even on carbon, a lot of that's estimated, or the or the ratings data, because you can't take it as quote unquote a kind of gospel truth. Even if we could say that on the value factor and financial and quantitative people, as you might see if you into this, are hot, hotly debating even something like the value factor, which has been studied for a very, very long time. It's it's kind of like uh, it, it would be out of this world if you didn't have a, a different order of magnitude difficulty on this whole area of like what I would call the ESG blob. Yes, I, I agree. And just on the va value growth thing, I heard someone uh, arguing passionately that Apple was actually a value play recently and my head just exploded. So yes, and I completely agree with you. That yeah, and you can, and you, you can, as this probably person make, you know, make an argument for it. Like people might not believe it, but there are, you know, financial basis ratios for making that argument that at a certain point in time, whatever, that Apple would be a, a value play. And yeah. you can always think about, you take the counterfactual sometimes, it's quite interesting. You know, does anyone want to buy an overvalued company or an unsustainable company? You go like, well, who would want to do that, right? In, in common language parlance. So so some of it is just a linguistic kind of almost um, uh, semantic debate around it. Okay, um, so all these ESG inputs and the process, so how, how does it end up in your decision? Is it literally a score or it never comes to that? Is there, I saw something on the website about ESG scoring. So does it end up in a, like a one to five? How does it happen? And again, just the highlights here then. Yeah, I'll try, I'm, I realize I've been giving you long complicated answers. This. So I'll try and give you the highlights. What you do is you look for the material factors which are driving long-term cash flows up or down. And then we embed those factors into an assessment on the business. So this was business model and all of these. Mm -hmm. And then integrate that into how it's directly affecting our long-term discounted cash flows. So up and down. And some people will, will mess around with cost of capitals and things like that. We prefer to directly into all those cash flows going up and down. You could do a carbon tax, put it in DCF up or down or not. So materiality is an important idea. So you don't want to bother with the things which are not necessarily that important. You want to really worry about the things which are important, how it impacts uh, business, how they think about the business model, and then how it's impacting cash flows. That's how we think about it. Okay, excellent. And then let's wrap deep dive one here. I've got a question on carbon dioxide equivalent and pricing. So here's the question. What shadow or actual price for CO2 equivalent per ton does your firm use internally for your own operations? And what shadow price or actual price is in your portfolio companies? So you ask these uh, on the surface, quite simple questions, which have these long complicated backgrounds and things to think about. Um, at the firm level, we are approximately in a single digit um, pricing on uh, carbon. Now, if you look at uh, European carbon prices at the moment, they're probably around 40 or 50. But if you look at North American prices, they are, uh, they are single digit. These are non-fungible markets at the moment. And there's a really, there's a whole show around uh, carbon markets and offsets uh, and, uh, and things like that. Actually, I was recently on a seminar for the CFA uh, Japan discussing uh, some of these aspects. The only other thing I would note is that Microsoft, which is considered a leader in this area, is also using single digit uh, uh, pricing as well. So there is a lot of, uh, a lot of push and takes and, and throws on that. But when we look at uh, the analysis of our companies, uh, where we find intense companies, we typically use scenario analysis with a variety of carbon uh, uh, pricing and in tax to see how that might evolve to give us a sense. Because again, the other thing you think about these discounted cash flow models and things is like, you know, you do all of this and you get a nice number at the end. I mean, that number is 100% absolutely wrong all the time, right? It's not that, but you're trying to get a directionally right in the same sort of bucket. And then with scenario analysis, you can stress test that saying, well, okay, well, what if I'm wrong about this? How wrong am I? Oh, you know, there's a hundred, a dollar carbon price 
just completely mean that this business model doesn't work or is it actually resilient to, to 100? Is it resilient to 40? Is it resilient to 20? What is the probability that some of these things have? Because when you think about, say, a contingent asset, uh, you know, an ESG asset or an ESG liability, some of those don't have a 100% chance of crystallizing. So you can probability weight where they might go um, either way. So when we're looking at it in companies for investment, there's a, a range of values. But as you alluded to, which is a subtlety in the way you asked your question, uh, operational is quite a different sort of uh, thinking for how you might think about a tax or a price, also different markets, because they're not fungible and, and where we are uh, in terms of policy. So sorry for the complicated uh, uh, answer, but it was a deceptively simple question as all of your questions are proving to be. We are, we are here for the long form interview with nuanced answers. You are listening to the ESG and Coffee podcast on investing strategy and sustainability. Espresso shot question set number two. Are you ready? Let's go. What app is Ben most likely to be viewing on his smartphone while waiting in line? Kindle. Well, that leads perfectly to question two, which is what book did you enjoy reading recently? Uh, Fathoms, the, mm. wor the World in the Well. And in fact, I have done a podcast with the author. It looks at the history of whales and humanity. So you can look mm -hmm. at how we have viewed the world through whaling, which is really fascinating because we mm. used to use whale fat and blubber, and it really mirrors and marks uh, a lot in terms of both social and environmental movements mm, and Mass by Rebecca Giggs. Very well. Yeah, recommended. We'll include that in the show notes. No, it's yeah. Massachusetts used to be one of the world centers for whaling. Did not yeah. know that back in the day. And I've read, uh, I really enjoy the polar explorers and you know, in the 17, 1800s, those, those whalers were doing some epic voyages uh, on, on their hunts. Yeah. Well, whale fat, essentially, I think at one point was, you know, a big percentage of, world fuel energy use essentially mm. we'll include that in the show note thank you what is the best kind of pie a growing pie or an <laughs> infinite pie <laughs> okay now you have so to an infinite an infinite pie obviously number because it kind of stretches out infinitely <laughs> and closed uh, and of course a growing pie which is the theme that we've been talking about is you know net benefit to stakeholders you do the best when the pie grows uh, you see, you just also there's a, there also there is an English and American difference because what Americans think of as pie is very different from what British English think of as pie. That's that's very true. You're also sliding in plenty of mentions for our mutual colleague Alex Edmonds' book, "Grow the Pie." We will uh, include. That. Oh yes, well that. Although yeah, he's used the phrase, but I think it's like it's not uh, not solely his idea. <laughs> of course, of course. Okay, so can I pin you down on a pie you could eat? Uh, oh, and a pie you could eat. For me. Yes. One with very good pastry. There you go. You know, you British guys answer this exact same way. I should have predicted this. Yeah. Um, very good. Um, the Great British Breaking Show. Is but the, uh, um, American pies are these kind of often sweet dessert things. You kind of have pie bars, yeah. right, and stuff. Yeah. yeah. So. Um, again, I'm from South Africa. This is all new to me, right? Yeah. <laughs> Although you do know when, you, when I think of pie, I do think of the number often, depending on the context, just comes into not like, I don't think of the whole long string of the numbers, but okay. as it being a very important thing. You well, know? There you go. That's why you live in a library. Um, <laughs> what is your favorite movie or on-screen moment that relates to the world of investing? And now given your own skill set and talents, I'll broaden this out to on stage performance, as long as the audience might know or have seen the stage well, production. Actually, I got it because of this interesting theme. It is um, Richard Gere in Pretty Woman. So Richard Gere in Pretty Woman towards it's, the end. So yeah. Richard Gere's character has basically been buying up uh, uh, companies in a like he's given this idea of kind of corporate radar, right? right. But right at the end, uh, he's convinced that he buys his company. But rather than like uh, sell it up, to destroy it, and do all of that kind of thing. He he turns around and he's been convinced that the person he's kind of corporate raided is like, no, we're going to build a company, we're going to build this, uh, we're going to build this together. It's got another second uh, pivotal moment in it because in it he basically says, 
uh, I can't drive because I was born to be driven, not to drive. And that's a kind of echoing quote because I don't drive uh, today. Um, and it's been quite good for my carbon footprinting. But again, this is talking about long-term trajectory. Like these driverless car things should have happened a little bit quicker for me because it's not really there yet. So <laughs> that's there. So I'm still very much a public transport or other Fair kind, of, other kind of guy. Yeah. We, we survived a year and a half in the Boston area through the winter with no car. So that was that was epic. Trying yeah, to much harder in the U.S., much harder in the U.S. Yeah, uh, especially those Boston winters are not easy on the bike eh, with the kids. Um, and then finally, from this second set, uh, as an investment professional, what was your most meaningful success so far? We wish you much success, Ben. But so far, you'd say, mm, th this is my most meaningful success. So if you want to keep it on the single stock idea, it's actually the reverse. So I have had a biotech which has gone very badly, but I have a, I had also a biotech investment which uh, was multiples of uh, how we invested and uh, they essentially cured a form of cancer. So oh, really? uh, they saved a lot of lives. So, wow. uh, so yeah, really good. I, you could define a good cure of cancer because you're talking about really uh, five-year relapse rates and mm -hmm. all of that kind of mm -hmm. thing, but essentially meaningfully improved people's lives with uh, forms of, of blood cancer and was bought out at a very good, at a very good price. But, but if you're thinking over the long term, it essentially was uh, investing in my own fund from right at the start, right? So this is just long-term investing. That's actually proven to be. So, so since you started your role as PM, you've been putting your own money in your own fund? Yeah, so this, I, I think you alluded to this. So uh, actually the vast uh, majority of my, well, I guess liquid wealth, right? If you exclude yeah. um, house is in my own fund. Okay. So uh, it, not actually that good for portfolio uh, or yeah, asset allocation because you're meant yeah. to think a little bit about asset allocation. Right. Uh, but essentially for various reasons, I don't. So it's like all equities, all my own fund. Okay. So and this is partly that. I do think that fund managers should really eat their own cooking to a very substantial yes. degree because uh, it gives you alignment over all sorts of areas. Yes, my, my personal favorite um, con concept that I've been promoting for years is every mining company CEO should be forced to live at the lowest level of the mine. I come from South Africa where the mines go kilometers underground. And that circularity would help align incentives. It's a le less extreme, extreme approach compared to yours. Right, into deep dive two, investment ideas. Very simple question. Interested to see how you answer this. Where do investors... <laughs> None of your questions are simple. <laughs> That's where... just the wrong way of starting them. Go on. <laughs> where do investment ideas come from? <laughs> so you, you've, you've, you've done it, right? That's not a simple question. So um, we do... Uh, a fundamental analysis. So let me take this example within healthcare. So net benefit to stakeholders, are you saving lives or are you saving uh, the system money? And we do a fundamental, well, I do the fundamental strategic analysis looking at healthcare, which is actually similar to what uh, companies do. Now, some of this might think, oh, that doesn't sound too strange. Well, a lot of uh, people within financial, uh, within asset management, start with a PE ratio or some sort of valuation metric, or maybe they start with a return on equity or return on capital or some sort of metric to try and funnel uh, their ideas. Whereas uh, I would say on something like, or my team would say on something like a PE metric, you need to know what you're looking at before you can give it a value. Like, are you looking at a Tesla or are you looking at a Skoda uh, before you can try and give a sense of value? So you need to do that fundamental, um, that fundamental assessment first. And then within healthcare, you kind of think, oh, well, actually, again, just give you that out of the, uh, out of the 2000 companies in the world or 2000 over, of, over say $2 billion market cap, you end up with around 400 or so um, healthcare uh, companies and you can split it within you know, just over 60% of them are say pharmaceutical companies, you can actually look at those pharmaceutical companies relatively quickly and show that quite a number of them don't have their majority of their products in unique life-saving areas. Actually, you have what we would call uh, me too drugs or drugs which aren't providing great uh, unmet medical need. Whereas you do have companies which are concentrated in say cancer or Alzheimer's 
or multiple sclerosis or areas are still of unmedical, uh, unmet medical need, right? Which is where you're saving lives or saving the system money, which comes from this idea of how you're providing net benefit, uh, a net benefit to your stakeholders. So our idea generation comes from that uh, analysis of the fundamental uh, wealth creation that we think is coming from uh, companies. So, so the investment idea, I mean, do you get it in the shower? Are you walking by the river? Are you in the third hour of a detailed presentation from the CEO on investor day? Like, wh when does that idea crystallize for you? So that strategic analysis will have the, uh, will have then the companies and then I can assess, okay, those ones are, uh, you know, don't have any life-saving drugs or like talk about this biotech. It'd be like, oh, this is a really interesting, I can see they're looking at this area of blood cancer and these results look, look looks like really good, saving lots of people's lives. Um, I discover that, that looks to be a great net benefit, like saving lives, like looks to be a strong effect. That's a ding, that's, that's an idea. Or this company, I look at it like not saving lives, I know there's a lot of other blood pressure drugs. I don't think that's very differentiated in the, in the not interested draw. You know, business model doesn't seem strong, not interested, uh, not interested draw. And then there's other things. Then you will go deeper dive into the company, say it's not a responsible management team, you know, not, in, not interested draw when you go further into your, into your due diligence. Okay. And, and I just thought to, to float this by you, you don't have to answer if you don't want to, but... BioNTech or Moderna, um, you know, they've been fundamental to helping humans meet this pandemic, this coronavirus pandemic that we've been through. And again, we remember how many lives have been lost and how bad it is. And back in South Africa, you know, it's 400 nurses died in this province that I grew up in. It's just, it's very tough still. In other places, happy days, people are getting vaccinated. But, you know, we can't not talk about coronavirus and the approaches to figuring out a solution. So have you ever, did you ever look back at the RNA approach of Moderna back in the day or BioNTech? Did that show up for you? Uh, the answer is yes. I've actually done quite a lot of work on our mRNA, um, but I don't have sort of specific comments on, okay. on a company. It's, okay. yeah. Fair it's a complicated area, but our RNA, uh, what I would comment on, like maybe this could be quite interesting for people who, who probably don't do, I mean, I've done healthcare in detail for over 20 years, is there's a lot of advancing happening within healthcare. So we have mRNA. We essentially reversed uh, blindness in mice recently. Mm. We have cell therapy. Mm. We have gene therapy. We have maybe uh, some breakthrough in Alzheimer's disease. We have um, potentially breakthrough in malaria vaccines. We've got a first round of malaria vaccine coming through. mRNA could be used for uh, malaria vaccine. If you're in the developed world, we can talk about this, but um, uh, childhood cancer is way down. If you are under five and you get cancer, you have an 80% chance of survival now. So you, there's been huge, incredible uh, healthcare gains. You see some of this in that, life expectancy uh, mm. going, going up and up. I mean, there's, there's other elements to it, but we're, we're making huge breakthroughs. And some of it is pretty complicated, but in terms of biomedical science, um, we are still, um, you know, you can argue about it, but for the last 10 or 20 years, we've had between 30 to 50 new drugs, new uh, pharma biopharmaceutical products approved uh, in the US well, kind of globally, but US um, every year, year in and year out. And we're still at that pace. Mm. So we're still finding uh, unmet medical needs. We've had breakthroughs in, uh, we're having breakthroughs at the moment in sickle cell disease, in beta thalassemia, in rare diseases where we would, we would never have anything, uh, never have anything before. Mm. So, you know, in a lot of this in, in terms and because progress in these areas, you know, it takes on average anywhere between eight to 12 years also to develop a biopharmaceutical. So vaccines were pretty fast and this, and again, on averages. So it sort of slowly dawns on you, uh, but we have had a lot of innovation and a lot to be um, mm. proud of in biomedical science. Mm. It always struck with me when I was doing the CFA exams, the, um, the first 
worked example I ever saw, this would have been you know, 20 years ago, was of a pharma, uh, analysis of a pharmaceutical and this issue of it, is it a patented drug and how what your window is to recoup the money and how long it takes to, to build it. The, beyond the scope of what we're doing here. Just picking up on that investment uh, ideas, there was, you had a great quote re- in 2018 um, in a webcast, I'll put it in, in the show note. You said, quote, material information inefficiently disclosed is an alpha source, unquote. Do you remember that? Yeah. Where did, where did that- what- where you want to comment on it? Yeah, so, so I've alluded to it two or, two or three times, but this is the idea that you've got very valuable uh, assets, call them, which don't appear on your balance sheet and so are not really reported in the annual report. Um, some of them are partially, call it intellectual capital, human capital, natural capital, positive, negative. All of these capitals, you know, these are sources of future value and wealth creation and they're not captured on uh, reporting accounts. Now, the second piece of evidence you need to be aware of is that um, the world has moved much more intangible. So compared to 100 years ago, where your idea was kind of all about widgets that you were trading, today it's not. In fact, there's a really interesting book by Jonathan Haskell and Stian Westlake, which uh, looks about this, which is um, a capitalism uh, without capital. Uh, I've done a blog yeah. about that, but you should have a look at the book, which explains this uh, phenomena. But when you look at it in accounting terms, uh, reporting accounts really don't capture a lot of this. And actually it's true on the GDP level, like only until recently were we capturing things like software and some R&D, and we're not really capturing a lot of this other sense. Well, obviously not natural capital, but even intellectual capital, mm-hmm. human capital, all of this thing is not captured. Now, if you are correct that this is a source of value creation and if it's not being reported in a number in the annual report mm-hmm. well the quants can't get to it right because they are quanting mm-hmm. uh you know the backward looking report and accounts for where right. they are and you can see that maybe they're getting a little bit from word scraping maybe maybe not uh but essentially they can't get that it's inefficient to them so to the extent that you still got humans who can make those judgments, and we have to be right, this has to be material piece of value creation or destruction the other way, because you could do it from avoiding, yeah. right? Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, avoiding uh, avoiding as well, particularly in a relative game. Uh, and then, because if you're right, you do see it eventually in long-term cash flows, right? You are competing your competitors and, and things like that through a better human capital, better R&D, better um, looking after your environment. Uh, and things like that. But because it wasn't picked up, because it was inefficiently uh, assessed by the market, then that is at least your theoretical uh, theoretical edge. Now you can mm. argue about, you know, can you really capture that edge or not? But mm. at least in theory, it should be there. And you do actually see it in theory in stock uh, return dispersions. There is backward looking, there is what we'd call risk return, this alpha, as we say in financial services. It just so happens that most managers have been quite poor at picking that up. I would actually add to that a couple of then extra other things is one is that this intangible part tends to seemingly price into the market over a longer time period. So this is a a price period. So actually we refer to the work of Alex Edmonds. He's gone something very interesting on essentially the strength of the employee piece. And he's shown that basically uh, better employee engagement or like stronger essentially human capital has led to outperformance both in accounting metrics and in also in, in stock performance but it's tended to be over the mm. over the long over the longer term mm. um, but to the extent that actually for instance although you can get it in some third party data sources right uh, is not something which automatically comes in the report and accounts how you could assess the relative strengths of say human capital on that so to the extent that that's inefficient and is a source of value creation then that should be a sense of uh, alpha or risk return generation. And I would go further because this is something we've been concentrating on for a very long time and we have produced outperformance uh, returns, then, um, then I, would, I would suggest that this is, is, a genuine, hmm. uh, is a genuine thing. Which you need to capture before somebody else spots it, hey, because investment is a competitive game. Well, it, there's a lot of players, right? If you're yeah. saying the quantitative people will never spot it, 
then you could say the price setters from the from the others will be so there will always be a part of the market which is inefficient in this sense to this uh, uh, to this area and you can pass that differently as well so to talk about quantitative finance they they think about factors and then they think about so-called idiosyncratic factors or stock specific factors or they sometimes call this residual this is the stuff that the machine cannot do so mm. say for instance corporate culture you could very easily argue and most people would agree is uh, good corporate culture is good and bad corporate culture is bad right over the over the long term but a corporate culture by its nature you would say is specific to that company the quant model goes well that's idiosyncratic that's residual we don't we don't do that right that's that's not uh, value quality momentum or maybe some of these other factors yeah. that we define so it's never going to be in the model that they uh, that they do so uh, so in fact, for our sort of thinking, you want to make sure that your portfolio has got very high, what we would call idiosyncratic or stock specific risk, because mm -hmm. that's where the risk specific to a company, which are more likely to be ESG and intangible and all these other things that I talked about uh, are likely to be within potentially mm -hmm. again, theory, which you cannot probably academically prove. Right. And, and so another important piece about this idea generation is, well, how do you shut down bad ideas? So how do you Ben? How do you critique yourself and or how do you as an investment team or how do you say we've checked it out now put it away it doesn't work it's not going to work so um we have various levels of that so we have a team meetings where we have team critiques and because we are all incentivized on the fund not on our own particular company or name we're all incentivized uh, to get it right uh, but then we also have other meetings I have a meeting with the head of the team, Habib, very regularly to go through ideas where we kind of go, you know what, that's not going to meet that. So we, we have team uh, meetings and also more one-on-one -on -one to, to look at that. And we can rope in various people where we think they have expertise as well. So something that's novel for me that Kathy Wood at ARK Invest is doing is she's kind of opened up her research team. I heard a head of research get interviewed recently where they can actually go on Twitter and get in a debate with someone, and I've seen it happen, they can get beaten up on Twitter, where they present an idea or a view, and they kind of use that as an extra external loop to, to check their thinking and their approach. Is there any, do you see strengths and weaknesses in that? Have you, do you have an external loop? So typically financial services will use uh, for instance, uh, sell side, or we also use an expert network to do some of that thinking on fundamental stress testing uh, ideas. Um, I find it's quite interesting that they are allowed to do that within social media, particularly in the US, because SEC are quite yeah. twitchy on mm -hmm. that. And for instance, even, uh, you know, even big CEOs of uh, car companies and the like have got in trouble with uh, tweets and stuff because uh, they would probably even on that come quite close to the line about where is something, particularly if they owned it or thinking about owning it, where does it become self-promotional and therefore yeah. actually investment promotion or not? Uh, and I'm sure you can stay on one side of the line or the other, but I could see that it might be a difficult line, uh, a difficult line to juggle. Fair enough. Uh, and then uh, another um, question on how you personally, you know, investment is a very insular world. We've flagged earlier, it's very competitive, it's intellectually challenging and, and so on, you know, big stakes. So where do you find a peer network to have conversations with? So we, so within team, I think it's, it's pretty good. Uh, and then we also speak with other teams within uh, RBC as well. For a lot of different thinking, I sort of alluded to this. Uh, I'm a playwright. I do theater stuff. Uh, I also organize um, something which I've loosely called a mingle, where you can just get together with other people to exchange their first ideas. I mean, that's broader than just investment. That's just trying to keep an open mind about how the world works and how we can all be involved in making it better. Excellent. I think, I think that's clearly working for you. So, you know, more strength to you on, on that approach. Um, I picked up a, a quick quote I just want to run through from your website again on valuation. And you talked earlier about discounted cash flow, that you know, the classic investment tool. It says, we use discounted cash flow analysis as our fundamental valuation tool because of the long-term perspective. 
It's consistent with our investment horizon and allows us to incorporate ESG insights into the valuation. So my question around uh, discounted cash flow is, it's all about the discount rate that you pull back those future cash flows to today's point. Now, two challenges. One is when the price of money is pretty close to zero, how has that changed your use of DCF? And a second point is, have you, how do you, if at all, touch on this issue of intergenerational equity, which is stuff that's happening today and some of the tension you could argue between the boomers and Gen Z is, well, you, you're leaving us with a world that's full of plastic and, and climate pollution. So if you could touch on either of those, if it's too long, long of an answer, just give us a highlight and we'll move oh on. Oh my gosh, this is a two really big question. I am split it into two, which could have two very complex answers. Let, let me just do the uh, DCF cost of capital uh, one. So um, one, uh, so I'm gonna concentrate on that cost of capital uh, question. Because actually, we don't like uh, fiddling around with the cost of capital. And we get into a long, complicated consequence about capital asset pricing models and mm. also discrepancies and things around that. Mm. We, we try and try to use it as a baseline to judge it about it. And so a framework where we can judge it and, and we keep the same sort of ideas of where uh, cost of capital is. What we much prefer to do is look at how cash flows are being impacted, either by business model, things like that. But if you talk about some ESG thing, let me just give you a sort of high level theoretical example. So if you're saying this company has much better employees, much better service and products, much better R&D than the industry or the peers, and you know that the industry is growing at 5%. So in year five, if you have 5% in your model for this company, one of those one of those arguments is wrong. Either the company is not better than the industry, right? And you've drunk the company Kool-Aid for whatever reason, or uh, all your model is wrong, is that actually you haven't reflected all of these long-term extra financial or whatever in terms of where those cash flows are won. So that's one use of where, of where the model will be. But it's much easier to then debate it in terms of how it's impacting sales. You could argue about margins or tax and carbon and things like that. But at least in, at least in terms of in terms of theory there, rather than thinking about, okay, yes, cost of capital in terms of like say where money is, that's true on a macro effect for whole markets, but we're really interested in, um, in where the long-term outlook for companies are. Okay, thank you. Uh, you're right, it is much longer and we'll maybe pick that up on another podcast. Um, very quickly, uh, can you just uh, opine on company turnover? You did touch a bit on it earlier. Um, talked a bit about uh, portfolio turnover and what KPIs are you watching in your portfolio uh, on a daily or weekly basis, what have you? What are, what are the key things that you, you're just kind of watching the dashboard? So there's, there's a lot of standard things uh, that people would, would expect you to look at, like portfolio turnover and characteristics of uh, portfolio. Um, and all of those type of things. So I'm not going to mention those because any good standard institutional portfolio manager uh, will be looking at that. The one thing that we do that most fundamental managers do not do is what I alluded to in terms of risk. So we look daily uh, at, and we have a lot of abilities to triangulate that, the proportion of factor risk and what factors are in our portfolio or not. And what we like to see is a very large amount of what I alluded to earlier of what quantitative models call idiosyncratic risk. So we have very little named factor risk. So that would be things like quality, momentum, value, anti-value, growth, blind factor four if you're using statistical models, currency and all of that. That tends to be less than 20% of our overall uh, risk uh, budgets within the portfolio and about say in the ballpark of 80% is idiosyncratic because what I um, argued earlier is that a lot of intangible stuff or a lot of stuff which is specific to companies are going to be idiosyncratic and you don't get them in a the model because if you got a portfolio and say you could replicate your 35 stock portfolio but you could simply replicate it with 0.8 beta um, and value and momentum so triangulated it by two or three factors, and that could replicate within factors, say 80 or 90% of that portfolio. <coughs> then, 
then um, then you're not earning extra extra value. Where was all of that wonderful work you did on the cop company and stock level? So that would be a difference to us versus a lot of others. Whereas things like portfolio turnover and things like that is very well managed. And we use seven different risk models from four different risk providers to look at that. Wow. Okay. So um, moving on then to the the classic sell discipline. Yeah. So the defining characteristic of a good investor, one could argue, is when they know to say goodbye to their favorite stock ideas that haven't panned out for some reason. So could you, again, just give us some highlights on how you approach the sell discipline and as a second part to that, your answer, if you will, around when ESG factors trigger that sell discipline? So there are three broad reasons for why we sell. One is valuation. Second is a change in the competitive dynamics of uh, the company. And the third is where we've got our judgment wrong. So those are mainly the third uh, three buckets. Um, ESG can touch all of those. This is the light and the wave uh, question. I uh, can cut it with our judgment is wrong. Something changes with the external uh, environment around the company or the company's own strategy could change. That could touch on ESG. Uh, or, or not with a, with a lot of this. Um, valuation less so, although maybe it would be some part of say, I'm gonna make it up, but like a green energy trend has gone up there. And so whether you would want to describe that as, as DSD or not, has maybe made a company full in valuation, but it's the full and our, our valuation work, which would be uh, driving that. Okay. And then uh, picking up on environment, social governance, again, it's abbreviation. Um, for me, it's not an asset class. It's just factors that form part of every uh, investment and better practitioners are looking at ESG factors and maximizing the positive, minimizing the negatives. But how do you handle a situation where you're looking at a particular company and they're doing some parts of ESG well and some parts rather poorly? How do you, how do you balance those two things? So we do look at this kind of notion of a net benefit uh, to stakeholders. And uh, those, at the end of the day, sometimes will be judgments because you're, it's not easy uh, to put a price on it. Um, but some might be relatively easier judgments to make. So say you're looking like at a sector like tobacco. So on the one hand, you know your products are probably uh, um, shortening people's lives. You could try and make an argument on the other side as well. There's tax receipts and there's employees, but you kind of go, well, saving people's lives versus lending some tax and employees as a net benefit. I mean, it's not an illegal sector, but if you're kind of thinking as a net benefit within our framework, that's not something which, uh, which passes through. Now that's a relatively simple example to work through, but we will think with that mindset for more complicated trade-offs as well. So, for example, I have an ongoing debate with someone around the pros and cons of Facebook or Amazon. And, um, you know, there's many elements to the huge companies, trillion dollar companies or, or thereabouts. Um, I just I expect there's going to be more and more inquiry as the quality of data improves, as the number of practitioners are active in ESG and investment um, grows there's going to be more figuring and figuring, if you want to quote the Lorax, on, on what aspects of environmental, social and governance factors roll up into the valuation of the company and how to figure through those trade-offs. Yeah, agreed. So, so then uh, let me come, I'm going to kind of speed through uh, some questions I had for you as we come to land and deep dive two here. Let me land this way. Um, a look back and a look forward. You're in the UK, so I thought to ask you about the UK stewardship code. So assume our listeners are, you know, in Australia, South Africa, Europe, North America, everywhere around the world. So maybe a sentence or two, what is or was the UK stewardship code and, you know, the form that it's in now? Um, and then if you could, uh, a second question on what do you see as the future of ESG by 2030? You and your supposed simple questions. You know, there's whole workshops on the UK stewardship code over two or three hours, <laughs> and I, I should I should probably actually declare um, a sort of interest that I'm on the advisory 
uh, investor advisory group for the Financial Reporting Council, as it is FRC, which is the regulatory body um, which uh, publishes uh, the, uh, the, the stewardship um, the stewardship code. So it's a code which guidelines how you should think about your engagement and stewardship activities as an asset manager in the UK. That would be my best one line summary. I think that's uh, but it, okay, but so it's, it's, but uh, to put it in its kind of place in the global world, mm -hmm. it's probably the leading code for where countries and regulators think about the responsibility that asset managers have and asset owners, if they're big institutional, have as owners of assets, equities, bonds, uh, and others. What responsibilities do we have to both our actual clients, but also to say the stakeholders in terms of regulators and the general uh, and the general public as to as to what we should do when we are uh, faced with it systemically. It's probably important to note it also pairs with a corporate governance code, which corporates are meant to look at. So in, in some ways they reflect one, one another. And I'll just highlight just one thing, which is kind of interesting, which is which is developed on both sides of the code, whereas 10 years ago, there wasn't really that much uh, interest or regulation around, say, culture. Today, both codes um, have elements to culture mm. within it. So mm. this is one mechanism where policy and regulation might might look into how you might deal with it, saying, you know, do, do you judge this? Do corporates do it? Uh, climate, uh, climate would be another. Mm. And the future of ESG by 2030, ESG and investment, of course. We speak as uh, investment practitioners. Where, where do you think we could be by 2030? In what aspect? You, you get to choose, so you're the guest. Uh, so whatever I say, I, I guess it will probably be wrong. Um, we, but we will invite uh, you back in 2031. So. Oh, okay. I'll do one which is sort of a scance, but I think will prove to be right, is um, the rise of quantitative or what we would call beta type strategies, which are sort of, we call them passive, but they would call themselves rules-based uh, investing will be a much higher percentage in uh, 2030 uh, than it is today. And therefore in several markets will be the majority style of investing. It's actually already the majority style investing in Japan markets. Hmm. So actually active managers are uh, a minority, a minority voice. Uh, I suspect that roundabout by 2030, this will probably happen even in uh, even in U.S. markets. All right, we'll have you back in 2031 to pick up on that. Yeah. Right, a landing with a deep dive part two: greenwashing. So, so I don't know about you, but for me, greenwashing is real. It's been real for years. It's in small ways and big ways, all the way back to. Uh, Eco-imagination by GE in the mid 2000s. It's every time I see a Subaru with PZEV, which is partial zero emission vehicle. That's like saying I'm partially a Hollywood actor. No. Um, so question, do you agree greenwashing is real and how does it hurt the work that you, Ben, do? Uh, so I, I would go further back. It's been going on for a few hundred years, right? But this is, uh, in fact, you could go the other way. So in the 1700s, you had a uh, little uh, glassware where emblazoned on it would be not made by slaves. So this really? is from companies. So this, the start really, you could think of the fair trade movement goes back hundreds of years. So we, we think about some of these things as new phenomena, uh, but they're not. And that is because uh, markets are human constructs, which are bounded by social thinking, right? The parrot doesn't really care about stock markets or even laws, it's a, it's a, different, it's a different form of thinking. So to greenwashing, if you mean by that, they, they say something and they don't really do something. I mean, this has obviously been typical of both human and corporate behavior uh, uh, throughout time. It does make things harder because then when you have people who are saying or doing things, you will maybe then have to think twice or three times as to weighing, weighing that up because it's, it's harder to judge whether something is being um, authentically mm -hmm. done. But I don't, yeah, it's not, it's not a particularly new phenomenon. It's got a nice name and obviously some of this area there's been a greater focus. 
um, to, to some extent there is, um, you know, there's complexity. So I, I understand that, like our early example about a lithium miner. And to some extent, if you want to give um, some credence to what um, uh, someone who's generally not thought of as well in this area, but I think it's much more complicated, someone like uh, Milton Friedman, essentially some of his arguments against where was that is he was worried about what, what we would now call greenwashing today. So a company which does something and then says, oh, I'm going to use this for charity and therefore that's okay. Or some, you know, some element uh, around that. He, he was worried about those sort of effects, which is essentially a, an idea of some sort of um, purpose washing, greenwashing, or really not really doing what you say or using charitable or other donations hmm. to cover other aspects of uh, of your business or how you were how, how you're serving i would comment that that what's different now is its industrial scale right as the as the business of investment and financial services have looked for their themes and positioning and so on you know one thing for profit organizations do best is they do things at scale and the, you know, in the same way you think about plastic pollution, you know, every minute, another million items of plastic are made somewhere in the world and they will never biodegrade. So you know, it's just flooding the open space. And particularly, you know, it's flooding people who are looking to do a darn good job. So good. Let's jump yeah, to- So there, there is a problem of scale. That's true. But I would say that that's not, that's not unique to greenwashing, right? That's yeah. that's what we're seeing yeah. everywhere and everything, which, but that's true. That's definitely a true phenomenon. But this is why you've got this interesting pushback tension between globalization and localization, because that is a process, that's a process of form of this globalization bit, which we're now getting some, uh, we have over the last years, yeah. like pushback yeah. to some of that be because of the, you could call it unintended or uh, like effects, well, then even side effects of what, of what happens when you globalize. Mm. Yeah, do things okay. really good at scale, you're efficient, but then you're causing all of these other things. Right. You're listening to the ESG and Coffee podcast, hosted by Graham Sinclair. Sie hören den ESG and Coffee podcast. Ihr Gastgeber ist Graham Sinclair. Grab another sup of tea. Here comes your fast espresso shot question set three. Are you ready? Yeah, let's go for it. <laughs> Do you have a favorite type of tree and what is it? I'd like to say a living tree, but the I have... So there's been two sets of trees which have probably given quite a lot of meaning to me. One is in the primary rainforest in a place in Indonesia called uh, Sulawesi, where I traveled... Uh, there is one of the most uh, remote places on earth to meet uh, a semi-nomadic hunter-gatherer tribe called the Wana, who had only recently opened up to outside uh, contact. And it was quite eye-opening uh, just what really, well, on most measures that you look at, what extremely poor people with no running water, subsistence, women having to Uh, do seven, eight hours of their day, uh, grinding enough food so that you could eat. But it was in the middle of a primary uh, Indonesian uh, rainforest, which was also quite uh, spectacular. So that was really interesting to me. Um, the second was slightly based off a trip to Japan and their respect for trees. I was particularly interested in cedarwood uh, because of a bucket maker who makes buckets, and this is these sushi dishes, where you don't have joins, they're all jointed by, um, by cuts. So you don't really have nails or anything. And it's a particular kind of uh, cedar tree. And I, I was there with uh, my partner and our wife. And so cedar became kind of an interesting uh, tree for me. And there was a cedar on the plains of uh, Salisbury Cathedral Uh, which uh, um, which fell over in a storm uh, decades ago, and there was some wood from this uh, uh, from this tree, and I bought some of that wood uh, to carve an engagement ring out of that. So I would then probably say that cedar was then an, an, another uh, interesting tree for me. Wonderful. 
Wonderful story. Okay, uh, what one book on investing would you recommend? You can't, you can't, can't keep me to one book, can you? So, um, if you're interested in ESG, I could, I would say, because I'm a co-author on the CFA uh, ESG investing book. Then, I was obviously, waiting for that to get a plug. Actually, yes, you know what? I, d- I didn't think about that, uh, but I think as a as a host of, if you want to kind of understand broad in investing and where it's been and, and where it's going. Uh, it is it is still worth reading all of Warren Buffett's letters. And as a counterpoint to where uh, kind of more tech thinking going, all of Jeff Bezos's letters. So, yeah. uh, and again, you because you can take that with a pinch of salt or with the other one, but obviously extremely successful mm. uh, within that. Uh, mm. I would then actually go and say, you should probably read um, for more kind of life thinking around this, uh, Charlie Munger's which is Warren Buffett's business partner. Uh, the Almanac of Charlie Munger is a, is a very good read, uh, also some sort of psychological uh, principles. And mm-hmm. then if you're thinking about overview books, about areas, because there's a lot of standard areas that you'll, that you'll come across, um, uh, normal recommendations, but I would recommend um, Howard Marks, who has a book um, which makes you think about risk. Uh, Michael Mabuson, who makes you think about risk and uh, um size uh size betting those are two that i would uh, uh that i would think about and there's, there's there's some others and then i think an institutional space just because he's actually uh he's recently uh, passed away um david swenson who was the cio at yale endowment um that if you're thinking about institutional money management so you like kind of thinking well, what do institutions think about and stuff in endowments um, <clears throat> that's extremely insightful as to how an endowment might think about money Good. So, so that's one or more books on investing. We'll try and include all those show notes in the show notes. Thank you. Um, ben, I guess you've already touched on this, but a, a chance to answer again. How is your own retirement fund invested? Yeah, so the vast majority is in my own fund. Uh, so don't take that as advice because you probably want better um, asset allocation. And then a, a small amount is in... Uh, what you would probably call uh, VC direct um, private impact uh, type of things, but it's essentially uh, companies directly. I guess this, so. This is the angel, angel investing. Angel investing. But uh, but it's um, but it's essentially almost all under a kind of idea of sustainable impact of some sort, but again in a mm. complicated way. Okay, thank you. What advice would you give to your seventeen-year-old self today? My 17-year-old self would be, your father is about to die, but it is okay. Wow. It's going to be okay. And for listeners, I'll include a, um, a link to where Ben has, has written a bit about uh, his dad passing. It was uh, very meaningful. And thank you for sharing that painful time with, with the rest of us. Welcome. Um, and then five, what is your advice to people seeking to enter the field of ESG investment and finance tomorrow? What, what would you say to someone who's very keen, listens to this podcast, sounds great to them, and they want to jump in with both feet? I think generally this does apply to ESG and things, but we'll probably help you more generally in uh, thinking is to be curious. Mm. Mm. Excellent. All the right. other thing which would, which would help you or that you might not really have is, uh, I guess I would put under the heading of stamina, as in this is not a short-term thing. Right. Curiosity will help you. And then you know, some people talk about grit, determination mm. stuff, but uh, you, you kind of really want to know that you're going to stick, mm. stick with it. Those are the, probably the two things of that. Curiosity first. There you go. Well, I, I yeah, I never knew my early days as a cross country runner would matter so much as having to survive some of what we've had to work through, including the stamina of this fine interview, which is running long, but that's fine because it's a great interview. Right, deep dive three, and then we come into land. Uh, so all I'd like to pick up here is, can you talk very briefly about your fund performance um, over maybe twenty twenty and and looking back. Uh, you know, in in the efforts to keep it short, I, I would maybe just link back to the officials to the official stats. Okay, great. Let's but we that. have 
outperformed over the long term. Lovely. Um, and then uh, attributing ESG. So for me, it's a fool's errand to try and suggest there's an ESG alpha as like this finite specific piece that, that you can attach to some kind of performance or outperformance. Do you agree or disagree? Is there a so-called ESG alpha? And if so, how have you found it? How do you describe it? So as we discussed, if you consider ESG factor as akin to a value factor, that's a false equivalence. Uh, so in that sense, uh, no, fool's errand. But in the sense that we were talking about, say, looking at the Alex Edmonds work or there's some work by Caroline Flammer, where you're narrowly looking at, say, does better employee engagement as judged by this, you know, and you could say, well, our employees, do they come under the S of ESG? You'd probably argue yes. And he has shown pretty conclusively that those companies outperformed. You could argue about correlation and causation, although he adjusts for lots of things like various these other factors, that, then you would kind of say yes. And so if you want to extend and say, well, is that an ESG factor? And was that a factor in that? Then you are arguing for outperformance, but it's not, that's not a ESG blob. That's very specifically, do you think better humans are going to make better companies over the long term, which seems a much more, uh, a much more plausible thesis. And so there's, there's different elements within that that you can see. But again, my equivalence to that is we can't even definitively conclude today what's going on with the value factor, right? The, mm. And for some, that's already a false errand, maybe or, or maybe not. Mm. And then very quickly, um, you had the op-ed in the FTFM in January 2018, seems like a lifetime ago now. The world is different then. Um, and, and I'll uh, include this in the show notes, but I just want to quote the chief executive, uh, and it, it sets out how you would be meeting with a CEO, for example, with other colleagues in the investor industry. And you say, quote, the chief executive starts by referring to the importance of people, culture, values, and purpose. These are the principles set down by the company founder more than 60 years ago. Not a single note is taken on this point. And I just thought that was a great insight, be beautifully written, but could you maybe spend a minute on, on that moment where it crystallized? I, I could almost put myself in my shoes sitting at that table and that thought just very clearly becoming so obvious and, and then writing it in that way. So again, a deceptively simple uh, observation. Uh, I, would, I would take one step back and say there is an argument around how useful purpose is because the critics would say why those people weren't taking any notes is that it's simply all corporate puff greenwash or it's so hard to say is why bother even taking a thing because they're so well practiced uh what's what's going on there on the opposite side obviously the side i kind of more sit on is um you know and actually there's an interesting set of work coming out at the moment uh, I guess we can refer to called the Purpose Tapes, uh, which is done by the Purposeful Company, of which actually Alex Edmonds uh, and a couple of others have been a steering group on, which talks about uh, corporate purpose from the point of view of, of CEOs. Um, but if you're thinking about net benefit to stakeholders and therefore where you're meeting your uh, where you're meeting your purpose, on the other hand, that should give you huge insights as to whether or how this company is creating value. Kind of in some ways, uh, in some ways, should be fundamental. Uh, so I, I am quite critical of our industry for, for not doing that, but my peers would probably want to push back and say, but it's all greenwash. We've heard it a thousand billion times. I'm not going to take any notes on that for that, uh, for that purpose, but it does seem that it does miss uh, a little bit of the, uh, a little bit of the point. Okay. And one of the criticisms uh, that I've picked up around engaging with companies is if performance netter fees is what every investor is chasing and you and your team spend money to engage with the company and try and get them to move from a low level to a high level of some form of behavior that, that improves their environment, social and governance performance, you're actually soaking up your time, your attention, your assets, but there's 99 other free riders that are going to benefit on the changes that, that you generate in a company. What is your response to that criticism? So there is a free rider effect, I, I think, for people doing this well. Um, you know, there is a systemic one all over 
over passive. And to the extent that, you know, you've got a long shareholder base, uh, there is that. But I don't think that's a very good reason for not doing it because you are increasing value to, to yourself and your own stakeholders. So yes, there's a little portion going, uh, going elsewhere, uh, but that's, that's kind of how uh, the idea of, of, of companies and, and benefits go, right? You, you buy something, the company makes a slice of profit, some of that goes to employees, some of that's gone to your employer, employer um, suppliers, and some of that comes to uh, the company. So it's, it's a definite um, uh, issue and, and I think a real effect, but I don't think it's a it shouldn't really be a barrier to doing it, particularly in our form of investing where we only own about 35, uh, 35 companies. Mm. Maybe if you have the style of where you've got 100 to 200 companies, it's a slightly different proposition. Got it. Okay, so to the, the proxy voting and the annual meetings, I actually found in your proxy voting guidelines, you can find them online, we'll have it in the show notes, uh, comments around virtual shareholder meetings. Now, we appreciate because of COVID and pa- pandemic responses, everyone's on Zoom, we're doing this interview on Zoom. So it was interesting to me in kind of how it was already in your proxy voting guidelines. And it says, and I quote, there are benefits to facilitating virtual participation in shareholder meetings, um, but they could adversely impact shareholder rights, especially in the case of virtual only meetings. In our view, a virtual meeting experience is not directly comparable to an in-person experience for all shareholders unquote. And we have seen some grumbling, some resistance to how meetings have panned out. We're in proxy voting season uh, and or general meeting season right now in the US, for example. So how, what is your response to your experience of participating in, in uh, virtual meetings as an investor and or watching what's happening in the whole kind of investor, stakeholder, company space around doing digital meetings? Wow, your your simple questions that just as we've been repeating are really deep. So there's two or three points here: one practical, one philosophical, uh, underlying some of this uh, thinking. So again, for people that don't know, um, every year you have an annual general meeting vote with most companies, and you vote on things like directors or things which come up on proxy level. You're seeing a lot of these votes on things like maybe. Uh, climate or disclosure coming into CEO larger pay as a favorite. CEO pay yeah loads of things so these are the things which come up um, annually actually so this this is the thing so there's there's been a thought about um, access to management teams and boards and traditionally the AGM is one of those days in fact the only day mm. where shareholders if you're small or even if you're sort of larger but maybe not um, you know that influential where you get access to ask your questions direct to management and the board. And you've got a kind of almost a kind of a democratic sort of process or an inclusive process uh, to being able to do that. When you've moved that virtual, uh, certain companies have, I want to use the word abuse, but that's maybe a little bit too strong. I haven't got the word, but have, uh, have played with that. They've gamed, by, they've gamed it in some way. Yeah, they've gamed it by essentially restricting the kind of questions that you can ask. And actually, to some degree, uh, there's been some evidence that they even restrict who can gain access to that virtual meeting. Whereas the principle of the in-person release of the AGM was to uh, was to be able to enable that. Now, if you have a virtual uh, AGM, which actually carries through all of those principles, um, I, I actually think we don't really have, and no one has that much problem. So if the board is all there, management are all there, they're taking all day questions from their uh, uh, shareholders and anyone who you know has, has done that, then that's it. But there's actually more capability to narrow that sort of access within a virtual meetings. And actually over the last year, we have had some examples mm. where companies did seem to gamify that even to the extent that I think if you were like a small shareholder with maybe a very awkward question and okay, you don't wanna be uh, like uh, abusive yourself, but like maybe an awkward question, you were not allowed that awkward question and you were a part owner of that company. So that actually is your right. So that is the underlying philosophical and then practical debate as to mm. that so that like yeah in theory that actually is fine but actually in practice you're using it 
as sometimes as a cover to not allow that same sort of direct access. Excellent. And then uh, the final question is um, divestment. So uh, every investment decision has kind of a beginning, a middle and an end. All investments you will exit in some way. Um, but there's pressure in certain sectors based on certain environment, social governance themes to see more divestment classically around fossil fuels. Classically, you know, in at a much younger age, I was aware of divestment uh, around South Africa and apartheid and, and so on. So in what situations for you as a, the portfolio manager, will you do the Wall Street walk? Will you actually say, we've reached the end of the road here on the engagement, I've tried really hard, uh, you've promised to do stuff, and now we need to divest. How, how do those conversations go? What happens in that last meeting? How do you reach the end of, of your... Yeah, so way? philosophically, if you, if you think that the management are embarking on something which is value destructive and is not producing this net benefit, and they've made clear that they've listened to you or not listened to you and they're not changing their view, then that's no longer a good long-term investment of where we're thinking you know, this is the change of view, either a strategy or we got a mis uh, misjudgment or something's changed and that's happened. And, and therefore, uh, and therefore divestment is appropriate. And it could be across a whole range of issues. The, the maybe the underlying point behind this, though, is maybe to understand the different theory of change that people have between uh, divestment and uh, engagement. So, the thing about most actually bond and equity uh, investment by fund managers is it's what in what we would call the secondary markets. So I am buying or selling shares to another uh, counterparty participant, mm -hmm. usually another asset manager. Right. And so in that exchange of, of shares, there's been no new capital uh, created, which is different to like primary debt finance. Yes. Am I lending you actual money or yes. equity finance IPO or that for an actual project or for running uh, for running your business? Right. So those who argue much more for engagement say that as secondary equity owners, we make much more impact by engaging with management teams to influence how mm. they're running their business to say a no go decision on a project right. rather than by not having uh, by not having a voice. Right. Yes. Actually, some interesting um, economic background would be uh, from Hirschman, exit voice loyalty on this. And so the actually analogy with, say, South Africa and apartheid would be that whereas an embargo uh, or like a divestment is a social political uh, signal, which actually means that your engagement uh, can be made easier. In policy terms, this is something called moving the Overton window. So this is moving the, the uh, available policy for it. And so that enabled actually the mainstream diplomacy uh, to happen in South Africa is because of the pressure which was happening on the side, right? They are actually happening in tandem. Mm -hmm. And actually, there's an interesting third leg, because this wouldn't work unless you had another system to move towards, right? If you could only move between a dictator system and a dictator system, well, that's not going to work, but you could move towards democracy. So within this analogy, you need to be able to move towards a green solution of some sort, right? Some sort of innovation, if there needs to be innovation on that, as your third leg, because there's no point going, well, okay, I'm going to divest and that's it. If you have no replacement for something which is, which is definitively out there. So there's kind of three stalls which you are going to, are going to need is probably social political pressure which moves the Overton window which can make engagement to happen and which innovation and everything else is happening but you can see if you talk about it in terms of theory of change the theory of change on stewardship engagement is influencing companies and to have their real world effects that way whereas actually the theory of change from divestment when you're thinking about fossil fuel is a social political signal which is making policy and other things happening now there is um a little bit of uh academic argument as to whether cost of capital might change uh, within that as well. Data is very mixed within equities, actually is mixed within bonds, because again, there is some data on primary financing, right? If banks just simply refuse to lend mm. money, the startup money for a new coal mine, that coal mine cannot happen as a, as a primary financing, actually either debt on equity. 
in secondary markets, because of all of the difficulties of even trying to assess what cost of capital is, uh, there's actually limited evidence that uh, divestment is maybe actually empirically changing for it. But it's a very academic uh, mm-hmm. debate. You actually have some people on on either side of that. And that's even before getting into kind of stranded asset arguments. But one of the biggest theories of change within the divestment movement and why you might protest is social political enablement as opposed to engagement, which is real world change in the, in the company. But they're not maybe as orthogonal as you might first thought because they're working via different mechanisms actually. Mm-hmm. And, and that I think is something that maybe some people at the surface level of the debate um, haven't maybe uh, properly uh, been uh, articulated with. Mm. And I think it's playing out and, and more and more people are exploring. The, most, the strangest thing for me recently was hearing that argument made from Kelpers, the largest retirement fund in the US and famously kind of forward leaning on ESG and from the CEO Glasberg of uh, Glencore. Uh, Glencore. So that was interesting, but yeah, I, I think we'll learn much more um, and see much more the nuance of that going forward. Maybe give us just 60 seconds on, so do you send a final letter to say, like, we really tried, almost as a placeholder for if they ever turned it around, you would say, you know, if you're willing to ever come back to this, I would be interested in buying into your company again? Or do you so just quietly we, No, just- we do, we actually do. So this is one small change, is we will, we will now regularly tell so it doesn't happen very often um but we will tell companies uh, about it in a letter i think that's really important having worked in the space and seen the conversations that happen inside the company as well i think that's a very important step you you all have taken great well we've we've done so well we're gonna wrap up deep dive three and then run through our espresso shot for set so last question there's no wrong answer whatever you uh, is on your mind, I'd like to hear. So I'm writing a book on ESG in a hundred moments. I've been encouraged by Gene Rogers at SASB. We've been talking about it. It's going to be fairly accessible for a broad range. Uh, so maybe less nerdy than and some of this interview, but if you were to sit down with the book and there's going to be pictures and so on, and you page through and you got to the end and then you suddenly went, Oh, hang on. Graham didn't include this moment, which for me, Ben is my most significant moment in a brief history of ESG in 100 moments, what would that be? Well, I'm trying to think of one you might miss is I do think for good or for bad, uh, the Milton Friedman essay on social responsibility of business is in the top 100 moment Mm -hmm. Uh, on the political scale. uh, And I think it is noted, but uh, Greta Thunberg would, would, also be, I think, within that. You're listening to the ESG and Coffee podcast, hosted by Graham Sinclair. Вы слушаете ESG and Coffee podcast. С вами Graham Sinclair. Okay, excellent. Right, espresso shot four, here we come. We have 10 questions. These are adapted from the Proust questionnaire that you might've seen at the back of a Vanity Fair magazine or the Bernard Pivot version they used in Inside the Actors Studio. Are you ready, Ben? Go. One, what is your favorite word? Can't choose one. That's like choosing between children, particularly uh, uh, as a playwright. So we'll take can't as your answer. (laughs) Uh, what is your least which is not one <laughs> unless you like to put street so there you go what is your least pie maybe we should go for pie Done. there you go i will buy it as a mathematical number oh no that's not even a word okay yeah. see look, i don't i don't do well with your single word things no, let's no, try you again don't, you don't what is your least favorite word can't <laughs> i can't do that one either can't oh. do one word. Can't oh, do one right. word. How how can you be so reductionist? You're sort of saying, oh, there's this whole ESG thing and factors, and I'm not like that. And you kind of want to go through to like like single words. It's like, wow. Nuh-uh. I just <laughs> have such an appreciation for who you are as a human. I can take you in small chunks or in very large chunks. Uh, what profession other than your own would you like to attempt? Well, so I am attempting being a playwright. So this is uh, we can uh, I can do that one. There we go. What profession other than your own would you not like to attempt?
maybe just alluding to what uh, we were saying earlier, that uh, being a hunter-gatherer is not as romantic as some would make out to be. It's quite a hard, uh, at least it is today, maybe, you know, 20,000 years ago, it was different, but hunter-gatherers today work very hard. Fair comment. Whatever happened to Mark Zuckerberg only eating what he caught for a year? Remember that? Do you remember that? No, I don't really remember that. Yeah. What attribute does an excellent investor have? I'm going to come back to that. Curiosity. Which living person do you most admire? Oh, we're not. Uh, yeah, I can't do a single one on that. What is your greatest extravagance? I kind of I don't know people are going to think reading is really uh, like a shishi answer so I, I think I'm kind of going to pass on that as well. <laughs> we'll, take, we'll take reading you've used up all your passes. Um, yeah. Which talent would you l most like to have? So there's these, uh, there's these people who can easily speak a lot of languages. Oh. Uh, I think that would be a really interesting one. Fair. Uh, what do you consider your greatest achievement? I'm probably going to go for that. Again, another CCU one is bringing up children. Fair. Um, and what is your, I'm biased, of course, uh, on account of being a parent too. What is your idea of perfect happiness? The journey, not the destination. Right. And now your chance to ask our audience uh, your call to action question. So assuming we have uh, listeners from all around the world, some are professional investors, others are not, big or small, any, anywhere around the world. What is one thing you would ask them to do that helps move investment and ESG forward? Okay, well, in my show, Thinking Bigly is the one I can think of that. I kind of asked four things. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna try and get it down to one is, and an easy one, Okay, I'll do an easy one. Have one conversation. So mm -hmm. I usually talk about one conversation, uh, one letter, uh, supporting one innovation. So I, I do that as 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 my trio, uh, particularly when you're talking about the positive things. But if you're talking about one, then a, then a serious conversation, you know, maybe with someone who doesn't think like you over over these type of things, can be really fruitful. Uh, I think. Excellent. Right. To the final Goldilocks question. Tesla Inc., an American electric vehicle and clean energy company based in Palo Alto, trades on NASDAQ. One share of TSLA was closed yesterday at $571, down $18 odd on the day, and but minus 3%. Is that price too high, too low, or just right? So I can easily dodge this one because unlike Kathy, I have compliance issues where I don't talk, uh, we, we can't really talk about uh, individual companies uh, because people might then think uh, investment advice, promotion, and all of that. So, so I blame the SEC. Right. And the reminder to all our listeners, do your own research. This is for enlightenment. This is not investment advice. Right. Ben Yao, uh, the Senior Portfolio Manager, Global Equities at RBC Global Asset Management. You're one of the originals. Thank you for your work over many years moving forward ESG positive factors in investment. I like to say the investments you make become the world that we live in. So hear it from me and I'm sure many of the listeners. Thank you for the work that you've done. And now we keep the tape rolling to hear from Graham and his guest as they reflect on their discussion and anything they wanted to add. So maybe just very quickly, anything we missed or anything you'd like to restate, anything you hope to say? 
well, if you're interested in more about me, you can check out my blog at thendobetter.com. One line of work that I'm interested in is I do give a direct impact grants. So essentially, I'm looking for people who want to make a positive difference in the world. And there are £1,000 uh, grants uh, available for that. And that program uh, is still open. If you're interested in my theatre work, I've got a performance lecture called Thinking Bigly, which is all about climate change and how you can make a difference and things uh, to do that within finance. And I have just started a low key uh, personal uh, podcast myself, which you can check on on the blog, uh, mixing arts and various things. But for instance, uh, I had a conversation with Rebecca Giggs, who did that book on Wales. I had a conversation with one of the leading um, uh, British poets uh, the other day. So just generally uh, thinking about that. Brilliant. And and how do we get you on the investment committee of your alma mater? Oh, I... <laughs> um, are, you, are you talking about Cambridge or Harvard? I think uh, for both of those, it doesn't... Um, they have they have their own their own thing but they're, they're you know what they are they are progressing right actually they are. They are. Uh, and they are they are probably both uh they're both uh further ahead than uh than some so i'm not certain they they necessarily need me well, well thank you anyway ben you've been a, a brilliant guest i really do appreciate you being on Well, what a wonderful interview with Ben Yeo, Senior Portfolio Manager at RBC Global Asset Management. That's the kind of interview I was really hoping for when I first designed the ESG and Coffee podcast and thought about what is missing from the investment conversations that were in the public domain that I've been uh, a part of. You know, what was the gap in the, in the podcast and the interviews? Where were these longer form conversations, the conversations that drilled down uh, a bit more deeply and gave the guests time to expand on, on the answer with, with many layers? Of course, Ben was very, very gracious uh, and, and flattering with his comments about the questions. But that's really what I've hoped to achieve, that to have very precise and penetrative questions that helps pull through and, and um, get the guests to share most about what they're doing that's, that's novel uh, and to be respected. I hope you appreciate it uh, from Ben's point of view that he answered as fully as he could. I was a little naughty of him not to give us a better answer on the Goldilocks question at the end there around Tesla and kind of defaulting to what compliance would or would not say. I'm not clear on how a, a healthcare guy can't answer a question on an automotive uh, company. But I guess one day if we get to have coffee again at the Wired Puppy Cafe, he can catch me up on something I might have been missing. I really appreciated Ben giving us a variety of quotable quotes. One of them stuck with me, for example, quote, investing is not simply renting a share for a period, but taking an ownership stake in a business and accepting the responsibility that ownership entails, unquote. For me, that's a, uh, it's a differentiator in his approach and what he and his team are doing. I appreciate him also unpacking on uh, carbon footprinting and scope one, two, and three. Please appreciate that this interview was recorded um, over the fall and before COP26. Uh, and that's partly because we want uh, the interviews to be long form, to have a long shelf life, not just this week's news and, and dropping comments on what's just happened. But the, both the questions and the answers will stand the test of time. And who knows, maybe Ben will get to play a role at one of his alma maters, one each in Cambridge on either side of the North Atlantic, that perhaps he could be on the investment committee or in an advisory role when they're making substantial uh, decisions. And subsequent to our interview on... Um, uh, the, uh, Harvard University has subsequently made their divestment decision that would have been interesting to, to discuss with Ben. As always, I'll include as many show notes as I can, both that Ben has shared with me in his answers, but also in the research materials that I prepared uh, in advance of the interview and to ask him uh, the better questions. 
I'm not sure if we're going to get another guest soon who describes himself as a writer uh, and investor. I think that that was fairly novel. I respect what Ben is doing around autism uh, aware. Uh, and also the uh, the um, the 10,000 pound grants uh, that he's making. Uh, check that out at thendobetter.com slash grants. And I'll include the show note. So as always, uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. Welcome your feedback at ESG and Architect and at ESG and Coffee on Twitter or into the website. Please look out for the next episode, season one, episode eight, which will be dropping very soon. We've got a number of episodes that we're going to look to roll out before most of the industry looks to take a break at the end of December. A reminder, and my lawyer always uh, has me <laughs> being clear, this is not investment advice. These are investment conversations. These are interviews and conversations where we're looking to explore the architecture of these investment decisions and where ESG is part of that architecture of the investment decision. This is not investment advice. Please consult your advisor. I'm Graham Sinclair. Thank you so much for listening to this episode of the ESG and Coffee Podcast. We hope you enjoyed the interview with one of the originals in investing strategy and sustainability. Please subscribe on your favorite podcasting platform or on YouTube and leave a five-star review. Bad reviews you can send to Graham Sinclair at ESG Architect. All the details are in the show notes. And for news of our next guests, follow us on Twitter or Instagram at ESG and Coffee. Do you know an impressive human we should absolutely interview on investment strategy and sustainability? Please let us know on Twitter at ESG and Coffee. Our producer is Kat Farquharson on Twitter at Kat Farquharson and original music by Erin Bonney on Twitter at Erin Bonney Music. And of course, this podcast is for your enlightenment, not investment advice. Do your own research. You have been listening to the ESG and Coffee podcast on investing, strategy, and sustainability hosted by Graham Sinclair. Thank you.